Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this just-in-time information on pay, paycheck protection program loans. I can't say that three times fast. It's like a tongue twister. So today, um, we've invited a few people to come talk about their experience experience with the past round of the PPP loan, um, the second round opened today, or hopefully will. Um, and so our panelists today, we have James Sign, Executive Director from the MICA House, and NAM board member, in all transparency. We have Nancy Williams, No More Empty Pots. I always want to say cups and pots. Um, I think of you every morning with my coffee cup. Nancy, <laughs> I still have that one. And then um, Sarah Goyne, she's a commercial lender at First National Bank. And um, Abby is running our new webinar feature, and so we're, we're online here. So, Sarah, I'm going to have you maybe start. Things were supposed to open. Round two was supposed to open today. How's, how's that going? Yeah, so um, the second round was supposed to open this morning, and there is a system called eTran that banks use to connect with the SBA. And the last we heard was this morning. Um, that system was not working. So it wasn't quite accepting those applications yet. And we saw this actually happen in round one quite a bit. Um, just the system was kind of up and down. You know, when you consider the volume of applications that are being submitted, it's understandable. Um, so, and they were able to, to work through that and get it fixed pretty quickly. But um, that was sort of the latest as of about an hour ago. Great, thank you. Um, and I forgot, you would think I should be a Zoom expert as much time as I've been on here, but I'm not, clearly. I would say um, if people have questions, feel free to write them in the Q&A down on the bottom of your screen or in the chat box, and we'll monitor that as we go through in case there's any questions from our live audience here. Um, so James, you, you made it through the first round, got funding. How, how did that process go for Micah House? Yeah, so... Uh... Fortunately, I was getting guidance uh, pretty early from a few networks uh, that I'm involved in. Uh, one of those obviously being uh, the resources that NAM was putting out and sharing. So I started to have conversations. We use a contract accountant. So I started having con uh, conversations with our accountant uh, about pulling all relevant 2019 data, um, meaning payroll uh, specifically. Uh, I think what I knew pretty early on is that we weren't going to apply since we own our building, so I didn't have to worry about uh, the leasing of space. And additionally, uh, we have some federal grant sources that pay for utilities, so we eliminated those two items right away, and we're really just looking at payroll. And so um, started to work with our accountant to do that projection, uh, two and a half multiple of what we would apply for. Um, and really my whole goal with the deal uh, was uh, to uh, make sure that the amount that we applied for was in that forgivable portion. And so uh, trying to project when the loan would be originated, when the funds would be received, and then over that eight week period, making sure that those expenses that would be allocated um, would be uh, under that amount. So started that process pretty early also, um, had to consider with my executive committee uh, that, hey, we're gonna apply for a loan. So uh, we put out a resolution to our board of directors once we knew the amount that we were going to apply. And then working in the background also with a lender, um, Sarah can probably speak to the guidance that they did or didn't have. Um, but at the very least, we wanted to make sure that the lender that we were using, we had all the information that they had and that they were going to be requesting. So we were positioned with our resolution, with all of our forms from uh, 2019, the application, although it changed uh, kind of at the last minute there, we had to update the application uh, on that Friday. Um, uh, and everything was ready to go uh, on Friday. And it was relatively painless. I think we did have to send our bylaws uh, as an additional requested document uh, to our lender. Um, but other than that, everything was pretty straightforward. Great. Nancy, tell me about your experience. Um, our experience was a little bit different than that. Um, uh, I, I also uh, have um, been, uh, am a part of a few different networks. So uh, seeing processes that are were happening on other boards I'm a part of, 
uh, and having gone through some of this recently with our renovation of the uh, food hub and having uh, the, the board uh, having updated bylaws so that um, I could sign off on things without having to go through executive committee and um, do uh, all of the uh, extra work that a lot of organizations um, need to go through in order to take out a loan. We had already taken care of that and we'd had a board meeting in March. So we already had a resolution to uh, go through with that should we choose to apply. Um, and uh, I had taken guidance from different places, um, but having um, full disclosure, First National Bank is the holder of our mortgage loan that is uh, fill the gap for our renovation as uh, pledges uh, are coming in, we pay that down. And so I have a really close working relationship with a loan officer there because we've been working on with them for the past uh, three years. And so uh, he sent an, an email as a heads up, this is coming, this is what you need to do to get ready. And I said, that's great. Already I've talked to the accountant. We use a contract accountant as well. Um, and he had already pulled the documents and done a worksheet, so I had things that were ready. Again, the the um, the form changed, and so we ended up having to make some updates before we upload it. Um, but when I started, I, we had just finished a virtual happy hour uh, that Friday, and I was still uh, happened to be at the office. Um, and so, but I wasn't drinking that day. I was just sitting in and laughing with folks. Um, uh, I ended up having to, um, the portal open at eight o'clock. So I started trying to upload and it wouldn't take any of the attachments. And so I switched, uh, to, I changed formats, turned them into PDFs, all sorts of things that didn't work. Worked on that till about 11 o'clock, didn't work, sent a note to the banker, uh, and the stuff just wasn't working right on the website. And they worked through the weekend. Um, I haven't worked in IT before. I could tell where some issues were happening. Um, and so they were better by Monday. Uh, and uh, Sarah had reached out uh, and Alec had reached out ahead of time as well. And I sent some notes to them. The, the thing that made the difference for the uh, First National Bank process was when they realized that the technology was not working the way that they expected it to, they defaulted to real people calling you. And so I got a call from Angela at eight o'clock on Monday night saying, this is what we're seeing in the system. I just need to confirm which of these things is correct. Do you have what you need? And when you have the things that need to be updated, make sure that you let us know so we can make sure that we keep you on track. And so that personal handholding experience made the difference in us being able to get that application in. Uh, and uh, even though it was submitted three times, so the right one got in, the right documents were attached to it and it went through the process. And so um, I will say for folks, uh, make sure that you always have your numbers ready so that when the opportunities like this open up, you don't have to get ready, they're there and you can just pull it. Have those conversations with your financial folks so that you know what you're looking at and, and what you need to cover. We did um, need to pull in our um, uh, uh, mortgage interest and utilities and um, uh, insurance contributions for uh, staff, which is awesome because that uh, the payroll is the biggest part of most nonprofits expense as it was for ours. Great, thanks, Nancy. So Sarah, round two opened up today. What, what were some lessons learned from um, your first experience going through this, as well as what do you anticipate in the next few days? Very good question. So we learned really, really fast. And one of the things that um, was kind of our first learning was that um, uh, at the very last minute, um, the banks were required to um, really comply with the Bank Secrecy Act, which has a component that requires us to know our customers. And that led to a lot of banks closing off their systems to non-customers, which I think threw um, some organizations and some people for a little bit of a loop. 
um, including myself. And that was um, the Thursday night before the process opened on Friday. So there was a lot of counsel to, you know, make sure you're connecting with your bank um, to, to get this uh, in a position where, where you can submit it. Um, I think that I've heard um, two pretty significant credible sources that have said that this second round of funding will go much, much quicker than the first round. Um, I've heard as, as, uh, as short as two days um, that, they, that this funding would be expended. And that's mainly because so many banks learned so much from the first round that they then developed a queue system. So, and I can tell you that's what we did. Um, so we made sure all of those applications were ready to go so that as soon as that e-trans system opened at the SBA, we were able to hit submit and then all of those applications would be sent. Um, and so if you're not connected to a, a banker now, I would really encourage you to get started with that process because it's gonna be expended quickly. I haven't heard about any future um, potential rounds. Um, so we'll just sort of have to see what happens. Um, but I also have, I would say, some um, pretty practical tips for you too in completing the application. And as Nancy kind of referenced, and as James mentioned, um, banks are requiring a little bit of uh, some different information, so it depends on who you bank with. Um, but the biggest challenge we had was the SBA requires a form, it's called the 2483. And it's a two page form that you complete with whatever other documentation your bank is requiring. And we have seen so many um, applications being kicked back or not being able to sent, be sent through because of the errors made on that form. Um, the SBA is very, very particular about making sure that every single box is filled in, every single box, and you have to be the one to do it. Um, there's a question that asks, um, if the United States is, is the principal place of residence for all of the employees that were included in your payroll calculation and that box has to be checked yes, even though so many of the other boxes have to be checked no. So you're seeing people go down and check no, 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 no. Um, that one has to be checked yes. And then there's two, two questions. It's question five and six on that form that require initials. We have had so many applications that unfortunately had to be kicked back to um, the applicant to, to fill in those uh, initials. So just really, really um, pay attention would be my advice to that form and make sure that every box is checked, that every box, even if it's an NA, if it's not applicable to you, put NA, um, just so that there's no chance that it's gonna be returned to you and that you'll have to kind of start over from the back of the queue. That's, that's really helpful. I, I do think relationships are everything. And luckily, you know, we had a, a long-term relationship with our banker that helped out. My understanding though, also with this round is uh, PayPal is an option too for those people. Maybe if you don't have a relationship with a bank and bankers are swamped again, I'm sure. So that's something to consider. Um, and I'm not as sure, I know later today, we're having a conversation with the Nebraska Finance Fund to find out about the community development financial institutions. Um, the CDFI requirements in this round, that's something new from last time. My understanding is 30 billion um, will be distributed through those institutions. So we will post on our website and share with the CEO group what we learned from that, whether there's an easy process um, or if it's not an easy process, we'll let you know that as well so you don't waste your, your energy that way. And I don't know if anybody has any more information on that. And could you share if there are any CDFIs that are members of NAM? I know there are a couple in the community, but people may not know what that is and who they are. And who they are. Well, Omaha 100 is a good example of a CDFI. Uh, Northeast Nebraska Economic Development District up in Norfolk is an example. There's about 10 of them around the state, um, but this is a process that is not, they're not familiar with, um, depending on how they operate. So we will share that information and a link to where they can find um, those locations. You know, I think an area that really threw people off to the first run and it's gotten better, um, clearly this was the first time that SBA loans were made available in this way. And I think uh, asking how, what's your percentage of ownership? Well, if you're a nonprofit, that really doesn't apply to us. So, you know, you just, again, having everything filled out like, like Sarah was talking about was really important. Um, I think there's been a lot of confusion uh, about if you already get federal grants that pay for a position, what impact would this money have? And there's really been no clear guidance on this. We're seeing everything that, um, some states have developed guidance. I'm not aware for that in Nebraska or Iowa that said you can't double dip if you're getting, you know, pass through money, don't go after it. 
Um, we've also been advised if treat it as a loan. Um, and worst case, you keep it as a loan. And then if it's forgiven later, that's something to think about. I think the most important advice we're telling people is track how you're using the money. Um, you need to do it anyway for the programs, but I think that'll help you when you have like, you know, your federal program manager comes in in a couple of months and wants to know how that all went. Let's see, are we having, let me see if we have any questions. Nothing has come through yet that hasn't been answered. Um, but again, if attendees, if you have anything you are questioning, um, use the chat feature or the Q&A and we'll answer those. What, any, any other uh, advice or word, word of wisdom? We have a little bit more time remaining, but I also want to respect people's time if... Um, I will share uh, in uh, what we are planning to do uh, because it is a loan uh, until it is forgiven. And so the guidance has been suggested that uh, it's, um, it's booked as uh, a loan, uh, as a liability, and we're keeping uh, the funds in a separate account and transferring over uh, as we're making payroll so that we know that there's a dollar for dollar match. Uh, and then whatever funds are uh, still in that account, uh, we know that we didn't expend that part and that it should be accounted for as a loan. And we can report that as such. The other hand, if it's all expended, then we know that we spent more than what we took out as a loan. Great, That's, thanks for that. A couple of questions have come in. So one is, what about independent contractors versus employees? What about seasonal employees? So independent contractors um, can apply on their own. Uh, so any business that employs independent contractors shouldn't use the, the independent contractors wages um, in their payroll calculations. Um, but independent contractors, self-employed, sole proprietors are all eligible to apply on their own. And there is, um, you'll notice on that SBA form 2483 um, that there's an appropriate um, uh, designation then that you would select your organization type right at the top. Great, thanks for that. And with those, I would say too, most banks are going to require um, a Schedule C or um, just some evidence of wages. So banks have to, um, banks aren't required necessarily to um, verify to the dollar your calculations, but um, rather it's the applicant and their attestation of, of wages that we have to rely on. Uh, mm -hmm. So the the um, the best advice I would give is is really show your banker how you arrived at those those calculations to the extent you can use federal or state documents to be able to show that information that's really helpful um, but you know different banks are going to require different pieces of information but having those available um, and, and you know getting in touch with your lender quickly would be um, my advice right now. Great, thank you. Um, another question, can you confirm the loan expenses would need to be incurred within the eight weeks following the receipt of the loan? Um, yes, for that payment to be forgiven. It's eight weeks from the, uh, the time you receive the funding. Now, again, I mean, there's sort of a theme here and it's that uh, we don't have a lot of details. So even on the forgiveness piece right now, the SBA still has to issue some final guidance to, to banks and to everyone really about what that forgiveness piece looks like. Um, but as we know it right now, it is um, for that loan to be forgiven, the funding would need to be expended then in the eight weeks after it's, it's dispersed to you. Thank you. So for those who maybe have been approved, got all their documents in, but they don't have money in the bank, the, the time frame starts when money's in the bank. That's correct. I want to clarify that. Um, this is a more general question. Uh, what documents should they have ready to upload? Uh, so I'll, I'll just field it and if anyone wants to add. Um, so all banks are going to be different. Um, so James mentioned um, meeting bylaws. Um, that wasn't something that um, we required. There may be other things um, that banks need on file in order to submit for you. Um, I would say that um, depending on the type of organization, the question or the answer may, may be different, but um, in general, um, for a nonprofit organization, we would require um, a, a 941, um, and uh, uh, you'd have to fill out the SBA form uh, 2483. 
Um, those are the two uh, real required documents and there may be some other things. Um, I liked to see and I asked from a lot of my customers um, to provide just sort of a, a um, how they arrived at their loan uh, number just so that we could independently verify that we're looking at the same thing and that those numbers are reasonable. Um, but, but for the most part, that's sort of, um, that's what we would require from a nonprofit. Um, but again, every bank is going to be different. So you just want to um, contact your banker. Yeah, it was interesting. We had to uh, upload our bylaws, our articles of incorporation, as well as our IRS letter. Um, wow, which was yeah. Interesting. And, you know, I get it. Yep. Yep. And just to add, we did our, we had to do our quarterly uh, statements to the, uh, to Iowa. So we, a, a few different documents there on employment uh, statements, as well as our quarterly uh, on uh payroll filings to the state, so. Yeah, it, it didn't seem like anything was that hard as long as you had your ducks in a row. Um, you know, it's just filling, filling out the form. I too got to fill it out three times. I thought I was ahead of the curve and did it that Thursday before it opened and then the form had changed by, by Friday morning. Um, and then my bank asked for a few more things as well. Um, what about seasonal employees? What if they are employed from May to August? Um, oh, you're muted. Am I oh, muted? Oh. No, I thought Nancy was answering. Oh, Sorry. Nancy, do you want to? Do you want to? Okay. So um, <laughs> the not saying anything. So. Uh, so the guidance was um, somewhat unclear about the time frames for the calculations. Um, so in, in one part of the guidance, it was very contradictory. So in one part, it said the previous 12 months, which you could sort of assume is um, Mar uh, March to March, so March 19 to March 20, or April 19 to April 20. And then in another part of the guidance, uh, you saw the previous calendar year, meaning calendar year 19. Um, and really, again, um, we were sort of, we sort of saw ourselves as a conduit. Um, to access the funding. So we weren't going to independently verify any kind of financial information other than to make sure that it was reasonable. Um, so if you're a seasonal employee, um, you would be, if, as long as you meet the other eligibility requirements, would be able to calculate those amounts, uh, calculate your average monthly payroll uh, times two and a half to arrive at your loan amount. Um, but, you know, you could sort of uh, use your own judgment about what time frame you use, depending on, um, you know, how you arrive at those numbers. That's a good, good point. You know, when I was doing mine, uh, I think last year we had, as an organization, uh, we had just opened a new component and we had a, a large amount of overtime paid as we were getting our staffing pattern right. And so that's a line item that, I deflated a little bit when I was figuring my number again uh, with my whole point was that at the end of this that I would be under that forgivable portion um, and I didn't want any of it even though a, a very low interest loan uh, I, I ultimately wanted after the eight weeks uh, for that amount to be expensed and so I think it is if you do that two and a half multiple right you're technically looking at 10, 10 weeks of payroll well if your business had if, if you have less employees than you did last year or for if things remained relatively status quo, um, you could end up with a little bit of money uh, if you were hoping for it all to be forgivable. And so that's my advice would be to work with whoever does your books and your accounting and, and really to do projections on, you know, maybe some recent payrolls that you have um, and then look at your insurance costs. And then uh, it, of course we didn't do the lease or utilities, but, if you have recent statements on all of that, try to try to use the 2019 numbers as advised in the past, but also look at your 2020 actuals to see uh, where you're going to be if you're hoping uh, that that amount is all going to be forgivable. And I think we're all waiting on the guidance and documentation uh, that we'll have to prove to make sure that that is the case. Boy, well, thank you all very much for taking time out of your day. To James, Nancy, and Sarah, I appreciate sharing your time, your information, your expertise. Um, this is being recorded. We will uh, share it. And as soon as we learn more about the uh, community development financial institutions, we'll send that out to our CEO list or listserv as well. So depending on if there's another round down the road, we might invite you all back if there's a Act 3.0.
Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know who's paying all of it back, but right. <laughs> so look forward to it, Anne. We really look yeah. forward to it. Brace yourself, because there's 3.0. We have oh bigger my concerns. God. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, it's all for, it's all forgivable. Uh, it's coming right out of my social security in fourth <laughs> years. I thank you for that, James. <laughs> yeah, you're you're welcome. Okay, so, well, with that, we'll say good, say our goodbyes, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks again. Bye. Good luck. Bye. Guys. Bye.